So we'll be talking today about Dewey's The School and Society. Um, I'm Dr. Ben Blair from New Lane University. I'm with uh, Dr. Avi Mintz, who's also from uh, New Lane University. And so we'll be talking about Dewey's The School and Society, um, kind of going over his overall central argument in this work, and then also reading some passages to uh, help you get a handle on, uh, well, first to experience some of, uh, to hear some of Dewey's words and to get a handle on uh, some concrete, concrete examples of his argument. So um, maybe Professor Mintz, do you wanna jump in and uh, introduce us to the work? Sure, happy to. So John Dewey, who's sometimes called the father of progressive education, uh, was a very important educational theorist. He was also a, one of the most important philosophers in America during his lifetime. He lived a very long time into his 90s and uh, wrote a ton. He wrote for popular magazines and he wrote books upon books upon books. His uh, collected works are, takes up many shelves at the library. Um, one thing he was always very interested in was schooling. And he thought about schooling, not just as an academic writing about it, but he wanted to see how his ideas would work in the real world. And so he created a school at the University of Chicago while he was there called the Laboratory School, where they tested out the kind of ideas we'll be talking about today. Um, Dewey, the School in the Society is a compilation of lectures that Dewey first published in 1900, the edition that, that uh, Dr. Blair and I are reading from was a second edition, came out about 15 years later. And um, it's as good an introduction to Dewey's educational philosophy as any. So I'll just say one other thing to set the stage. Um, if you ask John Dewey when he was writing about what schools were mostly doing, uh, how they approached children's education, you would have probably seen many of the same things we see today. Uh, you have math class, so you have you take out a math textbook, you sit and work on math for a bit, you put that away, maybe you have your social studies or geography class, so then you spend half an hour with the textbook for that, maybe you color some maps or something, uh, but then you put that away, you go from class to class and textbook to textbook, and Dewey thought that is a big mistake. So let's look at Dr. Blair, Blair sorry, he's going to read a passage that where Dewey uh, explains why he thinks that's problematic. Great, so I'm starting, um, this is from the first, the first chapter, The School and Social Progress. And Dewey is hearkening back to an earlier time where, um, all of life. So today we we walk into a room, we turn on a light, and the the room lights up. Or we go to the grocery store and pick up our groceries and come home and prepare it on our stove. And of course, life wasn't always like this. All of these things that have become so easy and so straightforward uh, in modern life uh, are the result of. Uh, a lot of effort, a lot of, of work, a lot of intelligence, and um, kind of transforming the world. And before then, um, in order to do these kinds of things, took a lot of work um, and took a lot of effort. So I'll read, let's see, I'm on page, uh, okay, I'll start on page nine, uh, the last paragraph. So back of, he, he writes, back of, the factory, back of the factory system lies the household and neighborhood system. Those of us who are here today need go back only one, two, or at most three generations to find a time when the household was practically the center in which we carried on or about which we cl were clustered all the typical forms of industrial occupation. The clothing worn was for the most part made in the house. The members of the household were usually familiar all, also with the shearing of the sheep, the carding and spinning of the wool, and the plying of the loom. 
Instead of pressing a button and flooding the house with electric light, the whole process of getting illumination was followed in its toilsome length from the killing of the animal and the trying of the fat to the making of wicks and dipping of candles. The supply of flour, of lumber, of foods, of building materials, of household furniture, even of metalware, of nails, hinges, hammers, etc., was produced in the immediate neighborhood, in shops which were constantly open to inspection and often centers of neighborhood congregation. The entire industrial process stood revealed from the production of the farm of the raw materials till the finished article was actually put to use. So first that part, the entire industrial process stood revealed. So much of what we experience today is hidden. It's, it's the work has been done by others. We don't know how it, how it came about, why we have it, how it is. It's just taken for granted. And it wasn't always like that. Um, not only this, but practically every member of the household had his own share in the work. The children, as they gained in strength and capacity, were gradually initiated into the mysteries of the several processes. It was a matter of immediate and personal concern, even to the point of actual participation. We cannot overlook the factors of discipline and of character building involved in this kind of life. Training in habits of order and of industry, and in the idea of responsibility, of obligation to do something, to, to produce something in the world. And this is a line that I always come back to. There was always something which really needed to be done and a real necessity that each member of the household should do his own part faithfully and in cooperation with others. Um, so first, just the image of this was all revealed. It was all in front of us. It was all in front of people at that time. Uh, there was no mystery. There weren't electric cords that were hidden behind everyone. It was, this is how things happen. This is how we get light. This is how we get food. This is how we get clothing. It was all on display and, and even young children could participate and they would grow up participating more and more as they worked with others and cooperated with others to um, do things that really needed to be done instead of uh, an assignment or some busy work uh, to keep kids busy. And, um, do you have other thoughts on that, Dr. Yeah, Benz? I, I think that's the, that description, what Dewey's talking about is really helps capture what he thinks wrong, is wrong with how we approach learning in traditional schools. And so, you know, the lines you read and what you were just saying, like where there's immediate interest, like children were learning always and historically kids learned before there were schools ever invented. But how did they learn, Dewey says? Well, they were part of a community. They were involved in the activities of the community and they were actively engaged in the things they needed to learn how to do. So they learned how to cook, right? How to make candles, to create light, how to do everything. And he said, so this is the, the main question he takes out of this. Like, is there a way we could make schools that where we would encourage learning that is much more quote unquote like natural? Like the way that kids historically have learned. And then uh, when he also says the way they learn best because they're not just set, told, okay, we're going to learn about um, food products and you take out a book and learn about it, but no, you're going to go out in the field and you're going to farm and you're going to learn from your parents and the other people in your community how you how you plant and how you sow and, uh, and how you reap the goods of the, of the fields. And so if we understand that is like the opening premise, how we can create learning that is more authentic and effective and get away from this very strange thing he thinks we do with kids where we just say, uh, leave all your experiences outside, but sit and do math for half an hour. Um, Dewey says, wouldn't it be better if we did math in combination with learning other things? Like if you're cooking and you have to, you can learn fractions by using measuring cups. And he says, show how these things are matter and children will learn them better. Love it. And, all right. And, so, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Just to add, just to uh, a slight other um note on that that there weren't if, if if a child during that time were to say oh why are we doing this 
that question wouldn't last very long. Like it was very apparent, it would get answered pretty quickly. Okay, why are we picking the wheat? Why are we milking the cow? Um, it wasn't busy work, it was clear. I mean, they may have, the first couple times they milk the cow, they may be asking, why are we doing this? But then it's all evident and apparent for them. Yeah. All right, so this kind of sets up if you're ready to move on to our second yeah. passage. So now we're in the second chapter, um, a few pages into it, I believe. Oh, yeah. Um, the chapter is called The School and the Life of the Child. So he starts summarizing what he calls often the old education or the traditional education. By the way, the progressives like Dewey, they often called what they were doing the new education as opposed to the old or traditional education. I'm going to read a, a full paragraph. It starts with, I may have exaggerated some. I may have exaggerated somewhat in order to make plain the typical points of the old education. Its passivity of attitude, its mechanical massing of children, its uniformity of curriculum and method. It may be summed up by stating that the center of gravity is outside the child. It is the teacher, the textbook, anywhere and everywhere you please, except in the immediate instincts and activities of the child himself. On that basis, there is not much to be said about the life of the child. A good deal might be said about the studying of the child, but the school is not the place where the child lives. Now, the change which is coming into our education is the shifting of the center of gravity. It is a change, a revolution, not unlike that introduced by Copernicus when the astronomical center shifted from the earth to the sun. In this case, the child becomes the sun about which the appliances of education revolve. He is the center about which they are organized. So this is a perhaps the most famous line in this short work where it's kind of a striking, powerful analogy of what Dewey and what child-centered education is about, right? What was the center of, what was the center of schooling? Well, the teacher, right? Eric's teacher stood in front of the class and all students passively stared at the teacher and tried to remember what she said, um, make notes about it, and then reproduce it back when it was asked. Dewey says, no, it's not the teacher that should be central. It's not the textbook, it's the child. And if we organize all of education around the child's interests, the child's needs, um, the child's needs to be part of a community, to be doing something that's meaningful, we will have rethought education in the most fundamental way. Dr. Blair, do you wanna add anything? Yeah. Um... Well, this gets to, I, I, I can't help thinking about the other book that's included in this text, The Child in the Curriculum, because there is an extreme where we say, okay, well, let's just follow the child and whatever their fancy is. Um, and Dewey is going to say, no, 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 it's not that you let the child run wild with whatever. Um, there are social concerns also, and, and the child in the curriculum is this dialogue instead of uh, how, it, how it has been where it's, look, the child just shows up and it's about the teacher and the curriculum and whatever, the child just sits there and is passive. Um, but the, I, I think it did take something like that bold statement and the, or that kind of provocative statement of the Copernican shift to say, hey, we need to get back to where this is meaningful, personal, and um, it's hard to say interesting in, with Dewey without um, in, invoking a lot of uh, baggage, but make it something that's personally interesting, something personally invested in the child in this education. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned like it's not just uh, the kids running around doing whatever they want. Some progressive schools were accused of doing just that. And uh, Dewey actually wrote a book uh, a bit later than this with his daughter, where he surveyed some of the schools that were a little bit more permissive. And then by, uh, so that was Schools of Tomorrow, which was published in around 1915, I believe. And then um, Dewey was though typically although subtly critical of those kind of schools. But by the 1920s and 1930s, there were a lot of schools where observers had gone in and seen 
teachers were really just letting kids do whatever they want. But it is important to note what Dewey is laying out here. He is specifically concerned about, like you said, not going to that extreme. So maybe this is a good way to introduce our next line because we're, we're going to talk next about how you get, how you can have both, how you can have a traditional curriculum, things we want to teach children, right? What role is, is there for a teacher in this? while we are keeping the child as the center of our new uh, universe. Perfect, so I'll, I'll read, uh, I think this is the, the passage you have in mind. I'm reading from page 75 um, uh, in our translation. Uh, so the first full paragraph on this page. From the standpoint of the child, the great waste in the school comes from his inability to utilize the experiences he gets outside the school in any complete and free way within the school itself. While on the other hand, he is unable to apply in daily life what he is learning at school. That is the isolation of the school. It's isolation from life. When the child gets into the schoolroom, he has to put out of his mind a large part of the ideas, interests, and activities that predominate in his home and neighborhood. So the school, being unable to utilize this everyday experience, sets painfully to work on another tack, and by a variety of means to arouse in the child an interest in school studies. And here's, here's an experience he tells that I think is great. While I was visiting in the city of Moline a few years ago, the superintendent told me that they found many children every year who were surprised to learn that the Mississippi River in the textbook had anything to do with the stream of water flowing past their homes. The geography being simply a matter of the schoolroom, it is more or less of an awakening to many children to find that the whole thing is nothing but a more formal and definite statement of the facts which they see, feel, and touch every day. So um, it's just a, 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 don't even need to say much about it. It's so stark and obvious, like, oh, the Mississippi River that they're talking about in this textbook, which seems like, uh, you know, they may talk about how deep it is or where it runs from. And it's, and these children have totally disassociated that with this stream of water that they encounter every day. And that is such a, a, a integral part of their everyday life, um, but they don't, they can't associate those two together. There's their school life and then their home life and the two don't mix. Right, yeah, so exactly. So this book is called School and Society. And so what's the main argument here? I mean, in this work in particular, and Dewey wrote many books and essays on education, but in this book in particular, and he, though he makes this point elsewhere as well, he is interested in how we can how we can uh, take down this wall that divides school and society and have some kind of rich interplay between the two, which, you know, based on the first quote you read, he thinks is actually going to lead to much more meaningful education, much more effective education. I'm going to just share my screen for a moment. Let's see. All right. So this is a diagram in chapter three. There's a few diagrams in this work. And there's just a couple of things I want to point out. So this is the model of one floor of the school. You may be surprised to see that of these five areas described in the building itself, none is the classroom, right? Students are going to learn in their dining room. They're going to learn in the kitchen. They're going to learn when they're sewing and working with textiles. They're going to work. They're going to learn in the shop. That's how they're going to learn everything, social studies, math, uh, science, geography. In the middle of the school though, so a lot of people said, oh, so Dewey doesn't actually care about learning. There's no curriculum, there's no books. But note that in the middle of the school is the library. And what Dewey envisioned is not first giving a child a book and here's how you learn math or here's how you learn the history of you know, the agriculture in the region, but that you actually get working in the shop or in the textile industry or when you go outside from the kitchen to the garden uh, and you come to the school with questions. And then when you have those questions, that's when you turn to books. When you already, when you're searching for answers or you're curious about a subject. And so the library is central in a very important way. He, he expects students to be going back and forth to the library all day long. 
they're using textbooks all day long. They're just, the textbooks are not the start and the end point of the learning. They are just a resource you use in the course of learning. Note also these, these arrows to business and to home and outside to the, to the garden part. He is proposing complete continuity between what goes on outside of school and what goes on inside school. A child comes to school from home with questions, concerns, and interests. And those are not to be left aside. They are to be brought in. Another important line that he has in, in this book talks about the importance of school as a community. And so outside of schools, kids learn by talking to others, interacting with parents. They shouldn't be just sitting still upright, hands folded neatly or taking notes all day long. They need to be actively engaged with other people. And so this, this diagram, I think, really helps uh, illuminate what Dewey is concerned with. And just on the one other thing about, you know, how this is not set up like traditional classrooms um, and back to this contrast that we've talked about now several times today about the old education and the new. At the beginning of chapter two, Dewey tells this story about how he wanted to buy, uh, to buy desks for his laboratory school. And then he's describing what he wants and he's seeing all these desks that people are typically buying for school rooms. And the person who's helping him finally says, oh, we, these, we don't have the kind of desks you want. The desks we have are for sitting and listening, right? Dewey wanted tables that could be moved around so, so you could open up floor space to work on something, on some kind of project that has moving pieces or that you can group tables together so students can work um, in, in teams. And so that was just for him, you know, a perfect example of how schools have failed to, uh, become meaningful communities or places where students can get work done, like real work done in the sense of having projects in mind where they, uh, are hoping to achieve a goal. Do we hope to create schools where they could do that? And maybe the, maybe the one thing that there's a lot of debate among scholars of how influential Dewey was. And some people say he was very influential, especially on uh, education, actually, in many countries around the world, including in Japan, actually. Um, and some people say, oh, it wasn't, you know, he was influential in the rhetoric, like how we talk about learning, but maybe not so much in what school rooms do today, because classrooms look, in many ways, look more like the traditional education we've been describing than what Dewey proposes here. But if you go into elementary schools almost anywhere, all you usually see desks that can move, that can be grouped together. And so there's parts of what Dewey said that have proved very influential. Dr. Blair, did you want to uh, talk about this relationship of school and society or anything else? Um, I mean, I, I love everything you said. I feel like uh, you, you pointed out some of the essential uh, contributions and influence that he's had. Um, I, and with this image that you've got shared here, just the, the free interchange and that like summarizes so much of Dewey, like, hey, more free interchange between these different groups instead of building these walls between different ideas, different groups, different um, what have you, that that is really uh, the spirit of Dewey is free interchange. And especially for education that it's not, there's your school life and there's your home life. Um, and then that you mentioned just now, and it brought me back to the first passage that I read that there's actually something to do. We're, we're not, it's not busy work. School isn't doing busy work. There's no such thing as busy work when, when there's actually something to do. And we're not having to come up with something to do or, or come up with something to uh, keep the students on task. It's, there's actually something to do. And when there is something to do, there's where when you're involved in cooperatively involved with others, there's that's where the real learning, lasting learning happens. Um, not when you're or and that's when you're you may be incorporating things that you've learned before or memorized before, but that kind of um, consummates your learning when you're acting that needs to be done. This is just something we're doing because we need to make up we need to use our time in some way so yeah anyway um 
Hey, I really appreciate your uh, insight and time on this, Professor Mintz, and I look forward to talking about more works and uh, other ideas in the future. Me too. It's been fun. Uh, yeah, I love talking about it. There's so much. We could have talked for hours, but dude, there's uh, so much good stuff there and uh, such, uh, such influential um, for next time. Then. Talk of ideas. Yeah. All, All right. right. Thank you. And we'll talk again soon.